Are you a business owner stuck in fear, doubt, and worry about what the marketplace will look like in the future? Then this show is for you. Strap on your seatbelt and get ready to disrupt and innovate. Here's your host, Lisa Levy. Welcome to today's episode. I am so excited to introduce to you today, Jeff Wade. He's a business development and sales professional who helps medium to large organizations improve their performance by 20%. He works with leaders and business owners to build strong relationships and strategic partnerships that lead to mutual success and guarantees the performance with his tools and his systems. More importantly for our conversation today, Jeff is helping mining, oil, and gas companies with exploration. There's an assumption in these industries that the way we've always done it is the best way to do it. It might be slow and expensive, but we do it because it works. There's a risk in this thinking that blinds the industry to new things that are coming their way. Today, Jeff and I are going to talk about game-changing exploration technology. I think it's obvious why he's here. Jeff, welcome to the conversation. Thank you very much. Grateful to be here and have the opportunity to talk with you. Fabulous. So I did a little bit about the, the, the structure of your business, but tell us about your journey and how you got to the things that you're doing today and why they're important to you. Yeah, with the gray hair and male patent baldness, it's a long story, <laughs> but I'll go tell it. <laughs> it's, yeah, I can josh it myself. I, um, it's, it's appropriate. Uh, <clears throat> like, look, I, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a funny career. I, I graduated school with engineering, computer science, automation sort of degree. So, you know, the, the, the hardcore technical guy. And, uh, and then a short time later, find myself in, in, a, in a leadership position at a very young age. And so I go back to school and decide that I need to understand the business domain. So I've got, got degrees in business. And then I, I really always understood that, that I needed to know a lot more about people. So I also picked up some extra qualifications in psychology and cognitive science and all of the <laughs> experts and expertise, all the things that you, you would think are important to a leader who wants to understand how to help or to for, basically create an environment to coach and mentor people to, to lift their performance and, and build high-performing teams. And anyway, what I learned to do or what I had as a natural talent um, fulfilled those sort of outcomes. So I kept getting promoted really on the, on the backs of what, what, what all my people were doing. And I, I worked for a number of multinationals and I worked in different countries in Europe, moved around the world a bit in Southeast Asia. Before, in my very last uh, role in the corporate world, I um, had a conversation with my chairman. I was a CEO, I was sort of a mid-sized company, and um, he said, you drive the board crazy. <laughs> Now, when your boss says that, you listen, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Whoa. It's a fabulous yeah. statement, right? Yeah. But is yeah. it a good one or is it a bad one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hold the breath. <laughs> Get the brain in order. Ask the question. Oh, that sounds serious. You better tell me some more about that. <laughs> and he's, he says, you keep asking these penetrating questions that have to be answered. And nine times out of ten, it's another expletive deleted transformation project. <laughs> And I stopped breathing again. <laughs> I was thinking, isn't that my job? <laughs> which, which I more or less communicated to him. And, uh, you know, I said, uh, I didn't think I was here as a caretaker role. Uh, it was to lift the, the organization to a new performance plateau. And he said, yes, and you're doing that really well, but it's a pain in the ass because you do it so fast and so intensely. And while the organization was coping well with that, it was clear the board was not. I just happened to be at a point in my in in my uh, career where um, it was appropriate to talk to my nominated successors and shortly thereafter would be gone and uh, have one of my nominated successors go in on the basis of understanding that she was going to slow down the rate of change, keep the board happy. Having some time on my hands and having just done another bit of postgraduate study, I had the work that I'd done for my thesis, my research, and my supervisor said it was fine, but I wanted to test it. I called around some friends and found an organization that was willing to let me come in on the basis of if it works and you solve the performance problem, we pay you. And if it doesn't, we don't. I mean, that's how I offered it. I said, yeah, I just want to test and see whether this makes a difference. 
we went into an organization we're given um, the worst performing business unit with about 600 people in it and it took us six weeks to lift their performance to equal to the best in the organization and the c the ceo had given us 13 weeks 90 days to shift the performance and i, I rocked up to her office at the six week mark hit the target <laughs> But I'll be back in, you know, another six or seven weeks because I think there's upside. She said, you just knock yourself out. <laughs> Anyways, when, when we were back at the 90-day mark, we'd lifted the performance of that business unit by 280%. And it became a very interesting conversation in the CEO's office with her sea levels. I wasn't getting out of that room until we'd rolled out what, what we'd done across 3,000 other people in the, you know, the sales and marketing function and then, and then another 3,000 in the customer service function of that organisation. And I, I sort of sat on the plane on the way home and thought, hmm, we've got something here. It was a lot of fun doing it. The people loved it. The commercial outcomes were fantastic. So, you know, the, the execs loved it and the shareholders loved it too. And so I started doing that, just started the business and, and did that with bigger corporates here and around the world. Along the way, we kept expanding what we were doing and we, we wound up working with the, the mining sector and the mining sector gets a bad rap, but I really liked the, the, the people in that space. <laughs> and we, you know, look, our, our product suite and the way we do things has expanded over time. But, and, and one of the things that we, that we do with a partner organisation is we build uh, what, what is called enterprise digital twins. So it's, it's, it's a mimic of reality. And then the other miners can jump in and rehearse different ways to, to run the mine that might be more productive or that might involve rolling out new technology. And that, that doesn't sound particularly wonderful. We know that sort of stuff goes on. But it's clever tech and it's designed by cognitive scientists and it gets very rapid change and, and extraordinary performance improvements when they when they deploy what they figured out in the sim. And for those who are not really familiar with the mining sector, put it in this context. These people, the men and women in that sector, you think about their daily work environment. It is really hazardous. You get things wrong, people die. They don't just get injured. You get catastrophic damage to, to equipment. It's a high-risk context. And they work in that context in order to, for us, get the, the minerals and resources that we need to support our civilization and way of life. So they're, they're naturally cautious. They, they understand risk. And, and when it comes to making change, they have to do it a little bit more carefully and slowly than the rest of us. And you give them an environment like this where they can rehearse it and practice it safely, it's a big thing for them. But in building those things, um, one of the things we began to appreciate more and more uh, was that the mining sector has information on its on its reserves, but not the sort of quality and depth of information that we had hoped or imagined they'd have. And that, that has a big impact on how they design the mine, how they mine it. We wanted to get more information into the simulations so that they could then think, well, are we mining it the smartest way or are there are better ways to do it? And so we went hunting for technology that would allow us to, when we build a sim, capture a lot more information on their, their mineral reserve and then put that in the sim. And then when they jumped in, they could go, holy cow, this, <laughs> this is good. <laughs> and so these, this approach started, right? The work that you do That's how it started. Yeah. starts with people, Yeah. right? People and then understanding process. And we, we didn't go into, into great detail, but what you know, the improvements and things that you found with your customers and your clients over time are getting the right people doing the right work and then yeah. leveraging technology to enable it to be exactly. easier and it's, faster. And, it, you know, it, there's, there are several different dimensions that we look at. And I'm not going to go into it because it's, yeah, you know, I can go down the scientific rabbit hole, but you did. It, we, we do look at the workforce, and, and for those who, who would like a little bit of an explanation, enough that's simple to understand without that rabbit hole uh, sidestep. If you will, one of the things that, that's been fairly widely acknowledged is a lot of organisations do not have reliable analytics on what drives performance. Now, that's that's the language you get in the reports that, that, that comes from the, the academic literature, but also from the big five consulting companies and things like that. In, in plain English, brutally, it's saying they don't. That, I'm sorry, I don't mind being brutal and mischievous. It's a, guys, don't take, take offense. You know, audience, when I say guys, it's gender nonspecific. But to, to your audience who, who are leaders in business, you know, that's a brutal statement because when I read it, I laugh. It's basically saying you don't know how to run your business or at least doesn't know how to run the people side of your business. It's it's funny. 
because it's not that bad. It's, but what it's saying is you, you just don't have reliable data that tells you what are the critical workforce experience dimensions or, or what are some of the critical leadership habits. Right. You, you know, we, we, we come in and we tell people, hey, there's 38 different leadership competencies you need and there are 12 clusters and you know, we complicate the hell out of it. But when you look at it, there might be half a dozen things that are really critical. And when I say really critical, they're the ones that have a high correlation with, if, if I stick with my leadership team, they're the ones that have the high correlation with the leader building a high performing team. And the, the, the question is, does the organization know what those critical, I'll call them six or seven things are? And it is about that number. Do they measure those things? Do they coach and build the competency of the leaders on those things? Do they hold them accountable on those things? Do they have great transparency around those really critical dimensions? The answer is they will have some idea, maybe on three of them. No, I'm generous. I, I, I Point to about half, but the dilemma is you need all seven. If I say seven, you need all of them, and you need all of them consistently, right? And that that's the problem. They they might have insight into half. They're overlooking the other half, and the other. But it's also exciting. You know, for, for your audience, please, when I say these things, don't think I'm criticizing. I get thrilled about that, right? Because I look at it the opposite way. To most people, you know, they're saying, oh, look, you know, here's the traffic light dashboard, red, red, red. And I'm going, thrilling. Because we've got diagnostic tools that will tell you what the reds are worth, right? And you can see with our diagnostic tools, oh, if I fix these reds, I can potentially tap into another 20 million a month. Um, you know, and, and so the reds are the opportunities for improvement. And, yeah, so we, we, we have analytic tools that look at between 25 and 50 dimensions that most organisations overlook. And we find the 10 that are red flags and they're not measuring and they're not managing and they're not having accountability and transparency around. And we help them fix that on the people side. And you get these big performance lifts. You said 20%. We say that because most people can get their head around it. Go back to the story I told at the beginning. Those sorts of numbers are impossible. And we'll come back to impossible because I encounter it all the time. But I can show you hundreds of case studies where those sorts of numbers. Typically. If I had thrown 280% out in an introduction, the audience oh. would have gone, yeah, right. And yeah, like, right. Yeah, I the credibility of that statement. Yeah, I, right. I worry about it yeah, yeah. because they've got to understand how and why it happens before they can go, aha. Uh -huh. And usually when they then go and talk to our past customers who say things like sign these crazy guys before someone else does, you know, they, they, they come back to us and say, how much did you pay for that? And we joke and we say, oh, those guys, we pay 80 million a month. And they go, what? No, that's how much money we made for them. <laughs> yeah. So I want to bring this connection back to, because you were getting into the the implication in mining and the, and the mm -hmm. risk for the people literally with the boots yeah. on the ground kind of role. Yeah. Bringing this story together, right, you you started wanting to improve the quality of simulations because you know yeah. that if we have the leadership team and they were building high-performing teams, when you're out in the mines, you were finding high performers everywhere. Oh, and so yeah. you're trying to kind of create situations where they're better informed so that we're improving safety. And along the way with that, you found a technology that is mind-blowing. For, yeah, it was, because I'm still a scientist at heart. I'm, I'm a, a leader in, in business and a people leader, but I'm, I'm also, you know, I'm, I have a scientist, a science degree, an engineering degree. I'm hooked on technology. And for me, yeah, I, I truly appreciated, as, as, as I've worked with the mining sector, not just the, when we were building simulations, they had less information than they wanted on their, their reserves or their, you know, or their, and this includes oil and gas. But um, I also started to appreciate the exploration cycle for them. And it's, in the last 30 years, it's been increasingly challenging, I, I think. And, and if, if I summarise the, 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 the cycle and, and then talk about the challenge that's been overlaid in the last 30 years, uh, the, the, the cycle is, it, it takes a long time, it's six to 10 years. And it's like, ooh, okay, this is a long business process. It, what's it cost? A lot of moolah, right? <laughs> a lot of moolah. It's, it's, you're doing well if it's 50 million, but yeah, if it can quite often be 250 million. And we've done some work with clients where the, yeah, the amount of exploration has been in the $1 billion category on one reserve. <clears throat> now, admittedly, that reserve was worth about 
66 billion, but, <clears throat> but still, it's a lot of dough. It doesn't give them an awful lot of information, despite the incredible time and the amount of money that, that they spend on it. And then it's it, it also doesn't have a brilliant success rate. This is the one where I sort of stop breathing because I think, yeah, I put myself in the shoes of the board of directors of a mining company, the, 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 the executives and the exploration function. And the, the success rate is, is around 5%. It's that is so so for you think the way I think about that I'm stuttering because I find it I get a little emotional about it. It's I spend say fifty million twenty times. <laughs> I can't get one productive mind out of it. It's like oh god that hurts. It's someone else's money, but I can feel the pain. Well, it's a <laughs> tremendous amount of time. It's an yeah. exorbitant amount of money. Obviously, the return on that is exponential in and of itself. But the time yeah, and the money they do it because they have become to. sunk cost. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Well, it's no, it's 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 the way it. It's the way it is. Now, let me tell you the, the, the 30 year trend that's made it, I think, contributed to that sort of outcome. And that is mostly around the world. We, we have discovered and explored, and, or, and we're mining what one would describe as the shallow or the surface presenting reserves. So, so in, in other words, you, you can explore the land, you can get enough information to know what mineral is there and with a degree of confidence, you might do some magnetics and seismics and then you can come in and drill and you hit pay dirt. But, but what's, what's happening in the last 30 years is the, the, the reserves that they're looking for are now what they call undercover. So they're going deeper, they're 100, 200, 400 metres deep. And there's not necessarily a surface presentation of the mineralizations. There's just geology that tells you there might be something there. Then we do magnetic seismic and oh yep, the, the underground geology, you know, it's a, there's a volcanic <laughs> intrusion here, and we know with volcanic intrusions, there's copper, gold, whatever. <clears throat> Let's drill and find out. And and you know, as one geologist said to me, you know, that, that that's often all we need to go and spend a pile of money drilling, which is expensive. And, and he said, uh, you know, it, it's almost like we drill blind. And he said, that's why the success rate is, is low, because we're, we're exploring more and more of this deep undercover stuff. And the, the cost of finding a decent sized reserve has gone up about eight times in the last 30 years because of that. And they're working, and the last thing I'll say is, yeah, mostly they're working with te technology that, that is not ideally suited to lifting their confidence in each step of the cyclones. Yeah, because they start off with a desktop study and figure out where they want to go look, and then they'll do some prospecting, and then they'll do some yeah, electromagnetic exploration. Finally, they'll do the drilling. But each step is supposedly trying to increase their confidence level. But at every step, confidence level goes up a little bit, but it's still total uncertainty when you drill. And that's, okay, so I'm listening well, to not, this. Not all the time, but often, yeah. I'm listening to this and Jeff, you know, just I'm a, I'm a tad snarky and sarcastic along the way, yeah. but I'm, I'm listening to this and thinking that the level of confidence and the accuracy of this process is not dissimilar to a divining rod finding water. It's, it's a little like that. That's a good analogy. <laughs> right. right? So I'm going to break in here and we're going to pause this conversation. Jeff and I have been having a really interesting time together talking about the business side of the consulting work that he does and the, and the impacts that they've made with their clients. But our conversation went on a little bit longer. And so we're going to save that for next week. That's it for today's episode of Disrupt and Innovate. Head over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. Every single week, one lucky listener that posts a review on iTunes will win the grand prize drawing, a $15,000 private VIP day with Lisa Levy. And be sure to head over to disruptandinnovate.com and get your free copy of Lisa's gift. And join us on our next episode.